<clears throat> All right, folks. Um, so there was a little hiccup. I lost connection um, as that video was finishing up. So um, I'm going to play it again and then pick up where I left off just because I got a good hour into that and uh, I don't want to start over. <laughs> so um, let's look at the gum bichromate process. Um, obviously, if you made it through most of it, you know, you can skip ahead in this video, but just so that we have a solid starting point, um, hopefully we can get through the rest of this without my internet going out again. So um, this is the, the gum bichromate process in relation to the Robert Damashi print that we were looking at before this thing had its hiccup. One of the major themes in photography is this desire to have a more permanent image. You have the Woodbury type, you have the platinum print, very stable, very long lasting processes. And then you also have the pigment family of processes, the gum bichromate process and the carbon print process. based on the light sensitivity of chromium. Mungo Ponton is the first person to really do experiments with the light sensitivity of this compound. Talbot himself experiments with chromium salts. He discovers that if you mix them with colloids, gelatin or, or gum, they harden when they're exposed to sunlight. Based on the work of Talbot, it doesn't take too much time for people to figure out that if we take a colloid like uh, gum arabic and we put pigment into those and then we sensitize those with chromium salts we now have a medium that can be brushed onto paper exposed to light under a negative when we put this piece of paper in warm water areas that are struck by light will harden and that's where the dark pigment will be and areas that are not struck by light will dissolve away leaving the white of the paper and so now we have a brand new printing process based on chromium. If you look at a gum print, the darker the picture, the thicker the deposit of gum. And the whiter the picture, the more you're getting towards the actual paper. So the image itself will have slight relief. One of the names that's associated with gum printing and, and carbon printing is Alphonse Poitvin, a Frenchman who perfects Certain elements of chromium printing, while it's imperfect, is the seed to an improvement that's later done by Joseph Swan that results in this, this process we now call carbon printing. It's essentially a, a piece of paper that's coated with gelatin that is bearing pigment. This thing is good tissue. It's, it's not tissue-like at all. It feels like a piece of plastic. The tissue is sensitized with chromium is contact printed with a negative. The light striking the gelatin hardens the gelatin selectively. That tissue now is put into cold water. A second piece of paper bearing clear gelatin on the surface is put in contact with the tissue. They're slid into a tray with hot water. The unhardened gelatin with pigment ooze out the edges. Uh, it's softening because of the hot water. You peel off the original tissue and by washing it in, in hot water, you then take away all the black that you don't need in order to get a continuous tone photograph. The image itself is, is very, very permanent. It's still being done today. Uh, there's still people making carbon prints today. Pictorialists really established photography as a fine art form. So they used things like the gum bichromate process or platinum prints that involved a lot of handwork um, and craftsmanship. So you really had a sense of the photographic object as something that was made by somebody. 
Alfred Stieglitz is the person who is most associated with um, what was called the photo secession. He and Edward Steichen actually um, co-founded the movement and they promoted this idea through a publication called Camera Work. Um, Stieglitz had a gallery called 291 in New York that showed photography as an art form. This is a camera that was used by Alfred Stieglitz. It was given to the museum by George O'Keefe in the 1950s. The opening of that lens determines the sharpness of the picture. If you open it up quite a ways, you get an image that's kind of soft on the edges. And he was interested photography and this is a lens that was designed to do that. Stieglitz and Steichen and Kazebeer wanted people to take photography seriously as an art form, not just an automatic activity that produced um, images without anybody's intervention. I think what the argument was really about was where is the creative input of the artist in photography and that's a theme that goes back to the invention of the medium. Okay, so now hopefully you've been able to watch that in full if you, because um, obviously the other one cu cut out on us. So let me get us back to our slideshow and we can get this back on track again. Sorry about the hiccup. I don't know what happened to my internet there. But um, the great thing about like that video, and there's another one we're gonna watch here soon. Um, hold on, I lost my place. Here we go. Um, is that you can kind of see the, the labor that goes into building these things and a huge part about pictorialism as you heard in the video and hopefully have read in your textbook um, is that they were trying to bring photography on the level with art right there's this conversation happening throughout the development of photography where they're like is it but is it art and they're like, well, it's it's not like painting because you're not putting as much labor into it. So the pictorialists in tandem with their sort of disgust for industrialization and mass produced goods and the commercial photography, they're also sort of, not sort of, they are also trying to elevate photography to the level of painting. And they're doing this by bringing in all of this extra handwork. And so when these commercial producers see the sort of dollar signs around um, pictorialism and start to mass produce the soft focus lenses and the textured photographic papers that kind of take away all this work and this labor they're putting in, that, that's like totally at odds with what the pictorialists were up to. So it's important to remember all of those things um, when we're thinking about pictorialism. So um, the next photographer that comes up uh, when we're looking at pictorialism, in your book at least, is Heinrich Kuhn. And he made very painterly photographs, as did almost every pictorialist. So it's not a unique description to his photographs. I'm just bringing it up now. Um, the other topic that keeps coming up throughout our conversation about the history of photography is its relationship to painting, right? Um, and sometimes painting influences how photographs are made and other times photographs are influencing how paintings are made. Now some might say that the pictorialist photographs influenced impressionistic painting. Um, others might say the opposite of that, that impressionism in the movement itself influenced pictorialism. I'll leave that up to you to decide what your opinion is there. But all of these photographs have a painterly feel to them. So you can see photography again sort of following the rules of, of painting and making these very digestible works of art, right? These are not slick commercial photographs. They're not trying to sell you anything. Again, it's an experience. They want you to feel something, to remember something, to dream something, which all sounds very romantic, but that's what they were, that's what they were doing. 
Um, Kuhn, in particular, really disliked the snapshot photography. He was like, well, humans don't see in the way that those quick shots look. And it's it's hard to say, right? Like, that's his opinion, but it's hard to say if, how, how each individual human sees things, you know? I always think of pictorialism as more of a, a dream or a memory in the way you might think about imagery, whereas snapshots are like, oh, yeah, like, that happened. There's a truth there. But... Um, the thing about photographs is they look pretty spontaneous, right? Like this woman bending down and, and getting something out of the grass here. Um, but she wasn't just bending down. Kuhn planned out every single element of every photograph that he made. So he was very deliberate in the location that he was choosing. He would sometimes, ahead of time, sketch out how he wanted the photograph to look, like the framing, the way the horizon was, the gesture of the body, which parts would be in focus and out of focus. And he also was very attentive to how he dressed his subjects. So he would have chosen her entire outfit here down to the ribbon on the hat and the way that that ribbon fell over the edge of the hat. So all of the choices being made for these pictorialist photographs were, again, on the level of high art photography that we were talking about previously, on the level of painting. They were really elevating it here, and they were asking the world to sort of agree with them and say, yes, photography can be art. Then there's Frank Eugene. Um, he did a lot of photographs um, that, again, were very dreamy. Um, this one almost has a dark feel to it, and he used a lot of nude women. Um, if we were in class and could dig into this in a discussion, I would ask you to tell me what you think is happening in this photograph here. But since we're not, I'll give you the, the short version, which, you know, you can see the, the brushwork, right, from where he has sensitize this paper and it looks almost violent right it looks like scratches and the man they're both both figures are nude you can tell there's one man and one woman and the man has his back to you but the woman is facing full frontal and but her face is obs obscured right it's been kind of washed out so there's you know some questions of identity here there's gender roles um there's sort of the fact that you kind of expect to see the, the front side of a nude woman, but not the front side of a nude man. Um, you know, historical paintings, you see way more nude women than you do men. And so there's, there's roles here. Um, and then again, there's that sort of violence with the way the brush strokes are working into this. So that's just a starting point. Um, if you want to dig in deeper to that, I mean, I highly encourage it. But it's just something to think about because, you know, as I just mentioned with, you know, Kuhn's photographs, every single element of these photographs is planned out. Like nothing is left to chance here. It's all very purposeful and there's a reason behind everything. Um, pictorialists were really raising the aesthetic experience, right? They really wanted this to be not just an advertisement, not just a commercial photograph. It was an experience for you, like, like you would have if you were experiencing a painting. Um, Sergei Lobavikov was a Russian photographer, and they were really looking to reveal the more traditional rural peasant life and not as ethnographic data like we were looking at before when um, they were creating those little carte de visite to show, you know, the different types of people and their job roles and all of that. That's not what Sergei was up to here. Um, it was more like this expression of nostalgia and nature and simpler times and um and yeah there's there's it's just it's very different pictorialism is very different it's this this move forward to really push for photography becoming an art um sergey used 
the gum bichromate process, but there's also this other process called the bromoil process that was being used. So um, I'm going to show you a video. It's a different video. It's this actually actually this expert bromoil printer guy, and um, it's kind of great. So you can kind of visualize. It's similar to the you know the the gum bichromate process we were looking at, but but different. You know, so. Again, I just like to show you how these things are done so that you can have some sort of visualization. Um, I know that helps sometimes as opposed to me trying to describe in words how these visual processes work. So bear with me while I get that pulled up. And right, so here we go. Like I can get rid of it. 
choice, knowing when to take that sound enough. And if you look at the different wood textures, you wouldn't get that with a normal print. So, I mean, you're really just kind of watching him brush a piece of paper there, I know. But I think that, oh, hold on, I'm clicking on the wrong things here. But I think that it's important to see, like, how much they were dedicated to the handwork there. Like I said, they're not just... Um, they're not, they're, they're not just taking photographs, right? They're planning out every aspect of it. They're playing around with um, the, the focus, whether it's all blurry, like a fuzzy graph, or whether parts of it are in focus, like Emerson's selective focus, differential focus. Um, let's say they do take a clear photograph to begin with, then maybe they do the, the, the work afterwards on the print, like this gentleman was just showing you with the bromile process um, or what we were looking at with the gum bichromate process uh, again to, i said this earlier but sometimes they they take the negative and they'll they'll scratch into it or they'll melt it or they'll do some crazy things um, just to to try to really elevate this from beyond what you're seeing in the the commercialized aspect of photography so um i know that those of you who are probably in the visual communications um, program at the school, you're probably looking to get into commercial photography. And you're probably thinking, well, why do these pictorialists hate on commercial photography so much? Um, I mean, first of all, it was a different time. And also, there's two sides. You know, there's, there's folks who are, who are pushing for, um, well, there's three sides, actually. And I don't know if I would call them sides. I would just call them three different groups and you have those folks who are for pure photography right commercial photography photography as it is no adjustments no manipulations no art none of that then you have the folks who are like oh no it is art and this is why and we're going to show you and then you have the third sort of group of people who are like well why can't it all just exist like, why does there have to be so many rules and, and debates about the purpose? So keep that in mind, because that's going to come up a lot. It's probably going to come up, you know, in, in your thoughts with other classes and things like that. So don't forget that there's all these different sort of perspectives and worldviews that you can have on, on what photography is and what its purpose is. And, um, you know, it all, it all serves a different purpose, right? Um, so I think as far as pictorialism goes, there's, you know, a few good things to, to remember. Um, make sure that you recall the effect that pictorialism had on commercial photography and manufacturing, right? That's a big one. And then also the goal of the pictorialist movement. Those are the two big things to remember here. Um, you know, get into the nuances of the different artists and the different processes as much as you want. Um, it's probably going to be really fun for you to try to recreate some of these things in Photoshop because, you know, the labor exists differently now than it did then. Like, you can still do these processes. You can still do the gum bichromate process. You can still do the bromoil process. You can still um, manipulate negatives and print on different types of paper. Um, but you all have access to these editing tools on your computer or on your phone where you can kind of play around with making the digital version of what these types of things would look at. So I encourage you to do that if you feel so inclined. Um, this next section, this will be brief because I feel like your book tries to make it really complicated, but it's not. <laughs> um, so basically in this section called movements in magazines, it's really just about clubs, right? So there's these different photographic associations that start to be built. I feel like I've touched on this before, but I can't remember. Um, but they would bring together all these people who had 
you know, very diverse interests with photography and maybe they had different occupations. Maybe some of them were amateur photographers, maybe some were professional. They all had an interest in photography and again, its purpose and what their sort of, um, their photographic perspective was at the time. And so they would form these different clubs so they could come together and have these discussions and, and talk to other like-minded people about what they were doing. And some of these clubs would have, here's the, here's a list of some of the ones that are um, in your book, but some of these clubs would publish um, different like pamphlets or um, zines or magazines and they would cover different subjects. They would um, talk about art exhibitions, they would talk about travel, they would talk about uh, technical instructions like, oh, this is the method that I'm using to, to make my calotypes or this is the method that I'm using for gum bichromate. Um, and some of them would also, also talk about like the new commercial products that were coming out. So um, all of these clubs were, you know, from different areas, like you have the, the Vienna Camera Club, you have the Munich, you have the Vienna Secession, which is basically the folks who were in the Vienna Camera Club, but then didn't agree with what the majority of folks were doing there, so they would secede and make their own. And you have the Paris Photo Club, you have the French Photo Club, the Linked Ring, um, all of these, they're, they're just, they're clubs, you know, places for folks to hang out and talk about their mutual interest in photography. So around this time, the pictorialists are feeling kind of constrained by the uncritical commercialism of the older photographic organizations, the older clubs. And they didn't, they, they were like, they had opinions basically about the mediocrity of the images that some of the members of these groups were producing. And again, to emphasize, they were really against this snapshot photography. They thought that by giving the public sort of unfettered access to being able to make all their own images that then people wouldn't look at it as art anymore because they would be like, oh, well, I can do that. So what makes it art? Even though they can't because a snapshot is very different than what the pictorialists were doing. Um, so again, they, the pictorialists really believed that their photographs were equal to other arts, to painting, to sculpture, to drawing, to printmaking. And so they sort of, began some of these other clubs so that they could come together and talk about that. And so um, the the Vienna Camera Club, the Munich and Vienna Secession, all of those were were sort of um, founded by, um, I keep losing my train of thought, they were founded by pictorialists so they could come together and talk about these things. So just to touch on a couple of, uh, of these photographers again, you have Hugo Henenberg, and he was very much using a lot of naturalistic elements. You know, I've listed it out here, light and water and clouds and reflections. And, you know, his photographs are an example of something that's pretty clear, right? It doesn't have necessarily as much of the fuzziness that you come to expect with pictorialist images, but he was still working from that perspective of, I'm going to art, I'm going to make it an experience that you can kind of fall into, right? And you do get that from the way that his image is produced here. Um, and then you have Charles um, Puyo and his, fo this photograph, I really, I find it so charming because you don't see a lot of photographs of photographers like out in the field making photographs together. And here you have three different cameras set up uh, photographing this woman in the white dress under the tree. Um, Charles Puyo actually founded the, the Paris Photo Club. And then you have this other club called the Linked Ring. That one was uh, primarily a British foundation. And they sort of were like, well, we're the spiritual and aesthetic fellowship of photography and they held these very formal um, photographic uh, 
they're called salons and they would exhibit all the work that they approved as art photography and if you're not familiar with what a salon is it's basically a fancy name for like a, a a bougie party where you would have all the artwork up and everyone would come and talk about it um in these very deep ways um and then we have clarence white um, he was also part of the linked ring group and you, you can tell just from looking at this one image here that he had very strong pictorialist themes in his images. He would use these very deliberate and delicate atmospheric effects. It, you know, it's almost as if he, the way that he has built this image, like it wasn't a foggy day when he made this, right? But the way that he executed it, the way that he kind of hand worked the paper, um, he makes it have this sort of like heavy, cloudy vibe to it. And it's just very ethereal with this woman holding this orb. And again, um, his his sort of way of approaching things is similar to Kuhn in that everything was planned, right? He chose every aspect of this. And you can tell just by the placement of, I mean, not that he placed the tree, but he has framed this in a very specific way. And this is one in particular that I would always think about and be like, oh, that's something, that's something from a dream. Or you could align a story with it, right? In the way that we would with a high art photograph. Like this is something that you're like, oh, there, this could be like about a, a mythological uh, being or some sort of, you know, Greek tragedy, some sort of story there. So um, that's, you know, what a lot of them were after. Um, the last two that I like to touch on are kind of unique here. And so you have F. Holland Day. And a lot of times he, he was trying to explore these religious um, themes and, and he had a sacred art series. But he also had this other, like, and, and sorry, before I move on. So these, these sacred art series that he would do. And they definitely have a story behind them, right? He's clearly associating them with um, stories from the Bible. And so you have that element, which immediately puts it on the level of high art photography, which is leveled with painting. But he also had this separate interest in like uh, erotic photographs and um, Sometimes he would express that with nude and semi-nude photographs, and other times he would conflate it with the sacred images. And then you end up getting like, you know, controversial responses to that, right? Because people don't want to see religion conflated with eroticism. And so he, he was slightly controversial there. And then the final guy that we have is Frederick H. Evans. And you're gonna look at this and be like, well, how is this a pictorialist photograph? Because this is so incredibly different from every single other thing that we've looked at since I, I've said the word pictorialism here. So he did not wanna use any special lenses. He didn't wanna manipulate his negatives. Um, he was for what you would call pure photography plain prints from plain negatives and he was sort of looking to elicit this emotional and aesthetic response to the space and the light and the shadow that you can get in architecture but also he's he's creating this um this little room for you to kind of breathe here and you feel like you can you know, the gesture of the space, right? You have the stairs kind of flowing into the columns and then into that tunnel. And you're like, well, where does that go? So in a similar way, he's building a story and a gesture that you can kind of, um, you can you can mimic that gesture as you sort of flow through the way that you're looking at this image here. So um, he used a lot of interiors of English churches and cathedrals and, and large French homes to explore his work. And yet he's still sort of lumped in with this same group, but he's got a different perspective, right? So his perspective on pure photography can still fall within the pictorialist purview, um, even if it seems a little off. You just kind of have to consider 
the the goals that they were up to and he was he was definitely aligned with those goals so um so again things to remember about this section is really like the differences that all these photographers had but they were still kind of working towards that common goal of elevating photography to an art and that they were they were just trying they were trying to come together they were trying to build these clubs so that they could talk about their mutual interests and work together to you know keep the art of photography from falling by the wayside amongst you know the more prominent and and visible commercial aspects of things so that kind of brings us into the photo secession, which was brought up in the um, Gum by Chromat uh, video a little bit. And this is another section that I think can be confusing in your textbook. Like honestly, like part, m the majority of this chapter is, 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 is confusing. So I'm gonna, again, do my best to try to simplify this for you so that you can understand, you know, exactly what the photo secession was up to here. Um, so, the section in your book kind of leads off talking about a critic, right? Um, Sadakichi Hartman. He's he's a he's an art critic, right? And so there's this exhibition at the Carnegie Institute in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and the quote, and I'm pulling it right from your book here, um, pictorial extremists who lay more stress on individual expression than on any other quality. And with that statement, Hartman is criticizing pictorialism. Sometimes I think when you read that in your book, it looks like he's supporting it, but he's not. He's criticizing it. And he says that, you know, some of the works overstep all legit boundaries and deliberately mix up photography with the technical devices of painting in the graphic arts. And, you know, because this is you know, language that was used in the 19th century. Sometimes the way they structure their sentences isn't as clear as how we would today. So it can get a little tricky to interpret. But through both of those quotes that I just read of his, he is anti-pictorialism. And so he wondered whether pictorialist photographers were doing an injustice to a beautiful method of graphic expression. And he starts to question, like, why can't a photograph just look like a photograph? Why do they have to do all this other stuff to it? And so the answer is kind of like, because they can, right? Like, who's making these rules that say that there has to be pure photography or nothing? So he's calling for straight photography, pure photography. He doesn't want this, like, artsy photography stuff happening. And that's you know, sort of what drives um, these pictorialists even further into what is called the photo secession. And the photo secession is organized by two photographers, Alfred Stieglitz and Edward Steichen. Again, they were mentioned in, in brief in that video, and we're going to sort of talk a little bit about them. But uh, essentially, they wanted to create this American school of photography that was separate from the European school of photography. Because if you saw in, in that last section, a lot of those photographic clubs were in Vienna and Munich and Paris, and none of them were really in the United States. So um, Stieglitz and Steichen really wanted to develop a, sort of an American school of thought when it came to these things. So Alfred Stieglitz, he was one of the organizers of the show in Pittsburgh that Hartman was criticizing. He was also the editor of um, a publication called The American Amateur Photographer and Camera Notes. And Camera Notes is the one he's most famous for. But he was a huge supporter of the pictorialist photographers. He wanted to lead a movement here. And so in February of 1902, he started what is called the photo secession, formally. And the objectives there were very similar to a lot of the other clubs. He wanted to gather all of the American photographers who were making art who were interested in art, 
He wanted to bring them together. He wanted to continue supporting pictorialist photography and push that as like the American way of thinking about it. And then of course he wanted to hold exhibitions um, that weren't necessarily limited to people in his club. He wanted to be inclusive, right? So even though he had a very specific goal about what the photo secession was doing, he didn't want to exclude anyone who was maybe doing something different because you never know, like, you know, you could sway someone to your way of thought or they could bring something new into this club. So th that was a huge part of it was his inclusivity here. And he, he and while he was emphasizing the American artistic expression, he still was, you know, open to watching and listening and taking cues from the, the modern European art movements as well. Um, so he was this major organizer of new art photography, right? Both through his founding of the photo secession, his publications, the camera notes, the camera work, all of those things um, were, were just key here. Um, so the, the covers for the camera work were designed by Edward Steichen, who was sort of Stieglitz's co-founder. And I think they said this in that video we watched too, but Stieglitz also ran something that was called the Little Galleries of the Photo Secession. Um, and those were held actually in Steichen's studio. And they showed new photography as well as like all these works in other media. They had drawings, they had paintings, they had sculptures. So again, they were trying to really be very inclusive of, of all types of art. Um, and in that way, they were kind of saying, you know, if we exhibit photography with these other arts, then, then of course it's, it's on the same level, right? Um, so there's a few uh, projects here that I'll show you. Um, this is one of Stieglitz's favorite photographs that he took, and it doesn't look like a pictorialist image at all, right? It's very documentary in a way, but it's one of those that he was kind of waiting for the right moment, and you're you're immediately drawn to that man in the the top center with the hat, who's kind of bent over there, and. The, the gesture of that man kind of leads you around the image and you start to look at all the different people. And so this is uh, one of Stieglitz's favorite photographs. It's, it's, it's expressed in your, in your book a little bit more in detail, but for sake of um, time, I'm going to move on. Um, this one is called Sun's Rays, Paula in Berlin. And this one is really lovely because you have all of those bands of light kind of passing through the shutters of the window. And, you know, to capture this type of lighting indoors at this time of day during the 19th century is, it really requires some skill with your materials, right? Um, so photographers like Stieglitz would have been able to pull this off, but not everyone could have. And he's like a lot of the other pictorialists we've been talking about. He's very specific about how he's arranging his photographs, right? Every single thing in this frame is on purpose. So there's a lot of personal symbols in here. He, you know, that other photographers might grasp onto. But, you know, on the wall, there's photographs of Paula sleeping. There's hearts that indicate their relationship. Um, sort of the intimacy of being able to make a photograph of, in the 19th century of a woman writing at a table in front of a wall in which there's Valentine's and, and photographs of her sleeping is, is all very symbolic of a, a very intimate relationship between the two of them. Um, there's also his equivalence project, and this one certainly reads more pictorialist, but um, he did this series uh, where he made hundreds and hundreds of cloud studies, and he called them Songs of the Sky, um, but more formally they're known as equivalence project. And 
you know, this this really is his his ode or his homage to pictorialism. Um, he really was was trying to express those feelings of, you know, even though these are just ordinary clouds, they really do evoke emotion when you look at them, and especially if you look at them in mass. So um, I would encourage you to look up. Um, Stieglitz's equivalent series and look at how many of these he really had done. Um, and then we have Steichen, who was both a painter and a photographer, and you can see this, um, this is him here. Uh, he's got his paintbrush and his, his palette there posing as a, a, a painter. So again, he was he collaborated with Stieglitz on the camera work publication, the little galleries. He was a member of the Linked Ring, founding member of the Photo Secession, and he worked on exhibits that brought some of the modern European art over into the little galleries in the United States so that, you know, they weren't completely cutting themselves off from what was happening in Europe. They were still maintaining a relationship that was, you know, cross-continental, um, not quite global, even though the the sort of idea of the photo secession and pictorialism was a, a global moment. Um, so both of them were, were, were instrumental in this photo secession movement and the evolution of photography as an art form at this time. Um, this is one of his photographs that's that's actually quite lovely and you can see has been treated with some some color here so um regarding this this section it's it's important to remember what the photo secession was a response to right it was both a response to and i'm giving you the short version here it was both a response to pictorialism but also the criticism of pictorialism. And again, you can elaborate on that when, when, when you find yourself thinking about that topic. Um, and then of course, why was it important? And there were so many reasons why it was important, not just elevating photography as an art form, but also the, the sort of inclusivity, which with, uh, with which um, Steichen and Stieglitz kind of approached this, this project they were doing. So next, uh, we have women in pictorialism. And this is important because women get left out of a lot of things. So um, pictorialism had a lot of nature involved in it, right? And there's this sort of long-standing association of women with both nature and domesticity. And those two topics make women sort of a favorable subject in pictorialism. And so far, we've mostly talked about the men making images in pictorialism. And a lot of their subjects are women. But what about the women who are making pictorialist images? And we have first Anne Brigman. She spent a lot of time and energy uh, building these really ethereal, dreamlike, almost sometimes they seem quite dark, right? But she's always portraying women as spirits or souls of trees, um, objects in nature, right? She's aligning them with the rock, with the water, um, with photography itself. And here you have two women, one sort of a nude that's kind of blending in with the tree and another that has this, who is clothed, but is kind of leaning on her. And it almost looks like they're growing out of the ground with the tree, but melting into each other. And the way that she, she captures like this gesture, um, it, it really, it, it does bring you in and it makes you think about what is this image and what's happening here and why is it important and what's the story and does there have to be a story? Can I make up my own story? You know, all, all of those are questions that are generated when you're, you're looking at an image, um, particularly a good image. 
um, you can also sort of see the the halo around the 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 nude woman, right? And halos always indicate some sort of um, saintism or religious nod. So you can kind of see those themes being brought in in her images as well. Um, at this time, in the same way that I was talking earlier about how um, the advertisers wanted to bring women in to make the images and decide how to sell things, there was also this idea that women were better at portrait photography because they had this more intuitive grasp on, you know, emotions and they had a wider emotional response than men. Now, this is obviously something that has been a trope for women over time, but they started to kind of acknowledge that. And so women would do a lot of the, the portraiture around this time. Um, very uh, slightly different from Anne Brigman, who worked mostly in, in the way we see it here on the screen, we have Frances Benjamin Johnson. And I think she is so cool. She had so many things going on, all these different projects. Um, she had a very successful business um, where uh, in Washington, D.C., and she would make these, uh, it was like a studio business that she had, and she would make these beautiful portraits of people, but she would do them in this pictorialist manner. So she was kind of straddling that line of she was making money off of making pictorialist portraits, but she was still trying to uphold this idea of these portraits as art. So um, there was that kind of struggle with her, but she also would do a lot of um, architectural and industrial photography. And she was very passionate about promoting photography as a means of employment for women. So she was very supportive of, of you know, her fellow women. She wanted them to have jobs as photographers, succeed as photographers. And then if they didn't need a job, she encouraged them to play with photography and play with pictorialist photography as well. She also would write these essays for Ladies Home Journal. Um, she would address uh, delicate, uh, delegates of Congress. Um, she arranged a show of photographs by women. So she was, she was just very, she was a very big role in making sure that women had a presence and felt a presence and felt important. And, and it's, it, it's something around this time that didn't exist very much. So to have someone who was so successful at it and so good at it, um, was a really special thing for this time. The picture on your screen right now is this self-portrait that she made um, as kind of a caricature of the new woman. And basically the new woman was revolting against the standards set by men for what the expectations of, of feminine behavior were. And you can see here that she's sitting sort of what, what men might call aggressively, right? Um, in the 19th century, you didn't show your legs, you didn't show your wrists, you didn't show your ankles, you didn't show anything, even if you had tights on like she does here. And so she's got her skirt hiked up, she's got her legs crossed like a man, she's smoking a cigarette, she's holding a beer stein, and she's looking very direct and stern and firm and strong. And she's got all these pictures of of men on the mantle behind her. But like, this is her as the new woman, you know, standing up for women who are being oppressed. And, you know, this is, this is a very brazen image. Like she is not afraid and she has no reason to be. More subtly, other women photographers would often photograph themselves holding a camera in order to sort of show their capability, their defiance, um, which really, you know, let folks know who are looking at their photograph, like, oh, this this woman is is an artist. She has a career. Um, she's determined. So, you know, while not everyone made images as as uh, confidently as 
Francis Benjamin Johnson did. Uh, they all were trying to like make a statement. So in its depiction of women, pictorialist photography really expresses this sort of conservatism at this historical moment when more women were working outside of the home, right? They're working in schools, factories, and offices. Um, there's this whole international movement, the suffragist movement, that are trying to gain women the right to vote, right? So in Britain, there's these images going around that we would call anti-suffragist imagery. And they're they're sort of ridiculing these women who are trying to you know get themselves the the freedom to to vote here and the the so that i mean the image on the right here is basically just like kind of insane there's the headquarters opposed to women's suffrage right like that's a real thing that existed for people to go to and say like no women should not have any freedom they should live under man the image on the left is sort of what I'm talking about when I'm saying there's this anti-suffragist movement and men were not subtle about it. Basically, you have here this very disgruntled man doing laundry. Um, this is how you would dry laundry back in the day. You wash it in tubs and then you um, run it through this thing that squeezes the water out before you hang it up on the line. And that's what this man's doing here. Um, and it says, is your wife a suffragette? basically saying that if your wife is out there trying to get herself the freedom to vote, then you're the one stuck at home doing all the chores, which is clearly not true. Women were doing everything at the time. They were at home taking care of the children, doing the laundry, making the purchasing decisions, going out and getting themselves the vote, making photographs, and you know this is just sort of a petulant response. Um, to that and from men who didn't want to see women um, outside of the role that had been prescribed to them for so many hundreds of years. So to counter this, what the suffragettes would do is they would kind of show themselves in images as you know, tender mothers, caring homemakers who wanted to kind of influence the government's policy on you know, uh, what, they, what they were doing for for children, etc. So, um, alternatively, around the same time, and we've looked at, at this image already earlier, the acceptance of women photographers was kind of expressed in this advertising image of the Kodak girl. Um, so the Kodak girl was first introduced in 1901, aligned with, you know, the release of the, the Kodak camera and later the brownie. And I think I mentioned this earlier, it's been time now, but um, every time they would come out with a new Kodak ad, the Kodak girl would be wearing like the latest fashion, or maybe she'd be at the beach with her camera, or she'd be in an exotic place. Um, this one on the screen is quite simple. She's just standing on, you know, some cliffs with her, her camera, but they really kind of went all out with um, the Kodak girl. So there's, there's this acceptance in advertising of a woman being allowed to photograph. And, you know, that it, it's sort of funny that there's, there's all of this pushback you know, politically and socially that um, they had to deal with, even though there were little little movements forward with things like this, which kind of helped. So um, uh, the last thing I want to touch on is um, Gertrude Kasbier. Um, she, oh, I shouldn't say thing, the last person I want to touch on for today, uh, Gertrude Kasbier. And she is, you probably don't hear of her that often. She's not as prominent as, you know, Julia Margaret Cameron or um, someone like that. But as far as women photographers go, she was, you know, one of the most successful photogra um, portrait photographers in, you know, the first decade of the 20th century, so in the, you know, the very early 1900s. And she was, they'll, when you read about her, you'll read mostly about her images of, you know, motherhood, um, and sort of 
relating that to religion and storytelling, but she also did a lot of images of Native Americans, and she did very strongly, similar to Frances Benjamin Johnson, promote photography as a career for women. And so a lot of the the photographs, um, I mean, I think the, the two, the first two I have here are shown in your book, and the, the last two that I'm going to show are not, but um, her photos of women really relied a lot on storytelling. So the mother-child theme is very prominent in her photography, and, you know, this this particular one on the screen, the, the mother is kind of, they're, they're standing in an open doorway, right? And she's got her arm around her child, and she's kind of releasing her into the world. The door is this symbol of, like, passage into life, and... You know, then, of course, there's religious undertones embedded here, because if you look behind the mother's head in the background of the the, the photograph, there's, um, you know, a portrait of the, the Annunciation hanging on the wall there. So, again, when we're looking at, you know, when we're looking at photographs in general, we need to make sure that we're looking at all of the elements present there, because it's very rare that there's not a purpose to every single thing in this frame and every gesture and every hand placement and every thing about the outfits and the paintings that might be included and, and the doorway and all that. It's all very important. So, um, you know, that sort of breaks down this one here. Um, Gertrude was also, you know, part of the linked ring, a lot of the photo associations, so she was able to bring not only her photographs, but her perspective and point of view into the, con the, the greater conversation that was happening. And, you know, when I said earlier, inclusivity, even though the majority of the folks in, in the photo succession and the photo clubs were still going to be white men, they, they did not exclude women they encouraged them to be there. There's just fewer of them right now because they're, you know, still fighting for their right to be seen as individuals and to have the freedom to vote and um, not be sort of truncated by a man. Um, this is one of her portraits that she did. And she did a lot of beautiful portraits of young women, um, well, women of all ages, really. And this one's kind of a more sensual portrait. Um, it It's a little bit different than her, her themes of motherhood, but you can still kind of see a similar gesture here. And um, so this is a 16-year-old model, Evelyn Nesbitt. And, um she she was just she was sort of a famous socialite at the time so this is someone that um would have sought out Gertrude Kaisbeer to take her her portrait in this um central way the photographs that you don't hear too much about um but i think are are some of her most um beautiful but also controversial images um is her relationship with the the Sioux people and uh, there's two images here um, she she actually sought them out after seeing um, a group of them do kind of a parade past her home in in New York and she she had this like deep respect for the Native American culture and she maintained a lot of friendships with the Sioux and she wanted she decided she wanted to do a project but that it was she didn't want to do it for like any sort of commercial gain or commercial purposes she didn't want it to be printed in any booklets or emotional posters or anything that that had to do that she really just wanted to you know sit with them and and take these sort of strong formal portraits of them um all of these are in the, the Smithsonian collection today, and there are likely um, a lot of them online. Um, but you know, she not there's not a lot of conversation about these, and I think that they're 
they're really lovely, strong images. And I think the fact that it's called out in a lot of resources that she wasn't trying to do this for any commercial gain at all. She really just wanted to, you know, document them in this, this respectful way. So, um, you know, her goal was to kind of create these relaxed, intimate, quiet, and beautiful portraits of these, these men, um, not not wearing the the costumes that they would wear when they were performing to sort of make a living right just sort of the real versions of them um you know sometimes it, it can seem kind of tokenizing for a white man or a white woman to seek out you know a native american and and want to to document them but i think for this time for this point in time like the fact that she was not looking to make any money off of this was was significant. So, um, you know, always and and still slightly um, controversial depending on on what her true motives were here. But um, I think it's important to note like her different projects and not just her projects about um, you know mother daughter themes coming through in photography and her sensual portraits of, of women, but also her her quite stunning photographs that she did of the, the folks in the, the Sioux tribe. So, um, so that's kind of where I want to wrap it up today. Um, I guess keep in mind, you know, the significance of the pictorialist movement for women um, and the way that they kind of aligned and portrayed themselves within that situation. And, you know, think about the, the sort of, the significant, sorry, I'm stumbling over my words now. Think about the significance of pictorialism in general. Um, think about the significance of the um, photo secession. And of course, all of those like little scientific um, evolutions that happened around this time. And and that's that. Uh, sorry that this had to get split in, in two, but I uh, just uh, wanted to get it done for you and, and didn't want to have to start all over. So um, thanks for your understanding, and I hope you enjoy, and I will um, see you all next time. All right. Thank you.